Welcome to the Trinity Podcast. Great to have you all watching or listening today. My name is Joel, I'll be your host for today. And right here at Trinity, we wanna help everyday people discover an extraordinary life with God. Today on the podcast, my guests are Daniel Riddick, Tommy Carr, and Tom Messer. And we are in week seven of God Encounters. And what we're going to do today is we're actually going to dive into uh, the topic of what it means to have an encounter with God. We're going to talk about specific instances in the Old Testament. And if you've been watching or listening, you've been following this journey. But I thought it'd be good today maybe to kick it off with just a little bit of a recap. So we're uh, seven people in to this talk of God encounters in the Old Testament and it's been a really, I've heard some people say this has been one of their most favorite series that we have done <clears throat> in a really long time. And as we've been looking at these seven so people. So does that mean that we've had boring series? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's possible. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> However you want to take that. So we have looked at these seven people and we talked about the experiences that they've had with God. And I thought it would be good just to hear from you all. Maybe some highlights so far in this series, you all have been speaking from the stage, but maybe some things that you have learned uh, from about encounters with God. And then maybe we can jump into what does that look like in real life today? Do people still have encounters with God? And how do people have encounters with God? Kind of a recap, and then we'll jump into the topic for today. So let's start there. Pastor, what's some things that you've got out of this series and how do people encounter God today? Yeah, it's really, it's been a fun study. And part of the reason I think it's been good for our people is it's a fresh study. It's, you know, mm-hmm. I, I find it harder and harder to find things that I haven't talked about or preached about over the years. And so this was a real fresh look. We've never, a lot of these passages we've never done um, in our Sunday services. And so I think that was, that was a, a highlight. I think at the core of it, if you said, hey, what, what kind of was the underneath, you know, motivation here? here is that, um, you know, part of the Old Testament story and narrative is introducing us to God. And we need to, if you're going to have a relationship with somebody, you have to know what they're like. And so there, in, in, in each of these individual encounters teach us something specific about the character and nature of God and the way that God works. But overall, in general, you, you learn this, that one, God wants to be known. So he's a God who reveals himself to us, and the reason he reveals himself is he wants to be known. And so he, he does this in specific instances with these people because he wants them, one, to know him, and two, he wants them to know something about themselves and how they find their place in his story, what they want him to do. And, and you know, again, example would be Joshua leading the children of Israel into the Battle of Jericho, uh, Samson's parents about how, what role they play in and raising up a deliverer that's going to deliver the children of Israel. And so the, I think the big underlying thing is this, is we, we actually have a God who wants, to, wants us to know him, so he's going to reveal himself to us, which tells us he's a, he's a God who communicates, right? He, he used words to communicate to these people. And then he, he has a mission for us to be, we find our purpose and meaning in life, and and the way he reveals himself to us and teaches us what to do. Now, I think that's general broad over all the experiences. I think the individual experiences teach us specific things, but I think that, to me, that's the heart of what the, the series is about. Yeah, I would play off that. I think he's, he's exactly right where it's like God wants to be known, but what's helped me, I've been teaching in some capacity for about 33 years. Um, but the older you that's get... That's a long oh, time. Yeah, so that's the, a really long the time. The older you get, the, the wider and deeper the scriptures become. You know, they just get wider and they get deeper. And so it's not only that God wants us to know him, it's the amazing fact that God knows us. So in all of these theophanies or Christophanies, God meets them where they are. He's aware of the story. He gives them a specific remedy for whatever is in their life. Yeah. I saw, especially with Elijah, you know, he's pouring his heart out and God doesn't even answer. He just goes, you need a nap yeah. <laughs> and you need some <laughs> sustenance. Yeah. And then I'm going to give you a word. And just to see the way that God has dealt with people down in the sixth, we've already hit in the seventh, we've finished up is just to see how God is such a personal God and these encounter to show mm-hmm. us him. But when he arrives, he already knows us. Yeah. What's kept the conversation really fresh. And I think, I think it's interesting. You'd see this if you went back, even with our podcast, because we, we've tried, you know, we try to stay, you know, in the, on theme each week with uh, the 
the, the content of the, of the message. And I think if you went back and looked at all seven sermons and then even including this one, seven podcasts, um, what's cool about studying the presence of God is how he meets with people where they are and indifferently. You know, you've got the covenant with Abraham and showing the glory to Moses and the, the battle with Joshua. You know, it's, it's different. But then what has created this really powerful thread through all of them is how almost without exception in every story, there are some really common responses. You know, in, in nearly every story, there's some version of... Uh, I've seen the face of God, and they mm-hmm. and they hit the you know the floor in worship and reverence, and 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 so what's been really powerful, I think, about the conversations has been how unique they have been to each encounter, and I think it reflects how God meets with us individually, but then yet how the responses and oftentimes what it is that God is doing mm-hmm. is just um, incredibly you know consistent, not only across circumstances but through people and generations and uh yeah it's it's been a really refreshing um series i think in in our church you know one other yeah to pick up on that one other thing i think that gets lost because uh, again it's 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 seven different sermons in in the context of a you know a spread out over seven different weeks and, and you you're looking at each of the unique one it's, it's amazing when you think about it in in every one of these cases god was working in something on something to accomplish something before, during, and after the encounters with people. And it's a reminder that God's working in our lives even when we don't recognize it. And we may actually feel like, hey, he's silent or absent or distant or whatever. He's not. And we, and we may think, man, you know, if God was working, this, these kind of things wouldn't happen. That's not necessarily true either. We, we, we kind of learn that. And then it's really rare. In fact, I think you'd almost have to say, okay, the only person that in that whole series, if you take the seven encounters, that even asked God to show up was Moses. And, th- and that even in many ways is, I don't know that that's a fair, full characterization of what happened. Yeah. So God's working when we don't see him and, and we're not thinking about him. He's working on things when we don't even realize it. And then he shows up unexpectedly, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, like... And most of them were unprovoked, yeah, right, they, right? They just were these, which is, you know, to me... It was one of the things that makes me want to get up every day is I have no idea what God's going to do. Right. I'm, I'm kind of excited, you know, to think, um, mm-hmm. you know, man, this, it's not, I don't dread what I'm doing. I'm anxious mm-hmm. in, in, a, in a positive way and excited to see how is God going to work today. And God doesn't show up in my life in dramatic ways all the time, but he does enough that mm-hmm. makes me want yeah. to keep waiting for the next one you know it just and I, I think that that is kind of the the beauty when you particularly when you take a theme like this and then you trace it through scripture you you if God does this once oh, okay he does it twice does it three there's a pattern here mm-hmm. and there's no end to the pattern in other words the last time God shows up in somebody's life is not the last person in the series he keeps mm-hmm. showing up yeah, yeah. and and he's going to keep showing up in our lives as we wait on him, as we look to him, as we, as we engage in what he's doing in the world. So are encounters with God then meant to be always life-changing? I mean, we see that in these seven stories. Is it in little ways, big ways, every kind of way? Is that what they're meant to do is to be life-changing? Well, yeah. So, so let, me, let me kind of slant that a little bit, mm-hmm. Joel, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, you know, again, we're, we're talking about these Old Testament experiences and, you know, I mean, there's, the, the, I mean, think about the, and I, I really kind of wrestle this when I, when I teach the Bible and I look at people who, who are young, who don't have the depth of, of understanding. I mean, that whole thing with, with Abraham and the, you know, the smoking lamp and the burning furnace, I mean, that's a pretty, that's a pretty <laughs> complex kind of deal, you know, and, and, you know, we didn't do the Moses and the burning bush, but I mean, all those things are just very dramatic. You know, Jacob bladder coming down from heaven, whatever, yeah. wrestling with God and God, you know, God nails you in a wrestling match and you're going <laughs> to win for the rest of your life. I mean, those are all pretty dramatic kind of things. But what you, what you really begin to sense there is that, that those are previews and pictures. They're, they're episodes that teach us something about God. 
and those outward visible manifest, supernatural manifestations of God's presence are pointing to the fact that God does communicate with us. And in the New Testament, with completed revelation, the two things that are, are critical, we have the Word of God in, in complete, mm -hmm. adequate, sufficient form, and we have the indwelling presence of the Spirit of God. So we actually have God's manifest presence in our life, living inside of mm -hmm. us with complete revelation. And so now our encounters are inward and spiritual, not outward and, and manifested like, mm -hmm. like what they had in the Old Testament. And, and that's how God changes our life. It's through, it's through this reliance on his word. In fact, we're, we're gonna, our next series is going to really get into generosity. And, you know, this underlying truth kind of comes out that, that giving to God is just a simple matter of trust in what God says. And to the degree that you're willing to trust God, in any and in, in, in any and every area of your life, to that degree, your life changes, and and so an encounter with God will lead to life change, if you act out on what God is revealing to you, and I think God shows up for the purpose of changing our life. He doesn't. He wants the better version of us, what C.S. Lewis calls the future glory self, that what you're ultimately going to be when you're conformed to the image. And what he's doing in your life today is pointing you to that future glory self, that he is going to change you and transform you into the image of Jesus. So then I thought it was a great way that you explained that when it comes to an, you know, an inward <clears throat> encounter with God and an outward. Tommy, do you feel like there's a natural tendency as us as humans to always look for that outward encounter with God? If something could happen on the outside, that's what I'm looking for. And then if we do that, do we miss what God is doing on the inside? Yes and yes. <laughs> I think we all just by nature, and it may be personality driven in some cases, but some of us do look experiential and we want to see God move in a way like I'm going to lay the fleece out. Right. I still hope to see a lightning bolt. I hope to see something in the sky that gives me clear direction. I think uh, the last sermon we preached on Elijah. Uh, that's, I think the, when, that's the example. That's the example. Yeah. I mean, here he's like, hey, I want to see I this. See and, something. You know, he runs back to where he remembers God working in Moses' life, and he holds up the covenant. He goes, you promised you would do this, and here's ways you should do it, and I want to see this. And God goes, I don't have to act in that way. Mm -hmm. I don't have to come in an earthquake or a wind. I can. It's part of the way I do come. But in your life right now, what you need is a still small voice. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so for me, that type of, I would love to see it outwardly. Of course, we all would. Yeah. Um, and it would make life way simpler, <laughs> but also that inward growth and maturity is where really depth of relationship is. That's not to say though, mm -hmm. that God doesn't, I think here's the mistake is that we tend to say, oh, in the old Testament, he did this and the new mm -hmm. Testament, he does this. God still does a lot of sure. outward things. You know, um, you know, I say this mm -hmm. to my kids and, and to Lisa and I talk about this all the time is that God answers the prayers. We don't even pray. God answers needs in our life that sometimes we don't even think about. Mm. And, and some of those things are manifestations of God's grace in our life. They're in, they're, they're, you, can't, you can't look at them and say, that's simply God showing up. And God continues to show up. He shows up in people's marriages. He shows mm -hmm. up in in our lives individually. And, and, you know, he heals some of the inner wounds of our lives. It's kind of the story of, of, of Elijah. He, he does it in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to be careful is we don't, we don't just portray this that, hey, Old Testament, God shows up and he does this miracle thing. New Testament, it's just all inward and spiritual in the sense, well, that's how he works in our life. But it doesn't mean he doesn't do things. I mean, I mean I've seen people that have been healed of things that the only answer to that is God did that, and and it is, and it's it's God showing up. It, you know, I, I've said it so many times over the years in past. Sometimes it's just the atmosphere, presence of God. You just know He's there, mm -hmm. and it's the it's the presence of Jesus that you know <clears throat> brings light into darkness. It's the presence of Jesus that brings you know healing into disease or 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 you know, power into circumstance or whatever, whatever however it, get, it does get manifest. What, what we do that, that that working though is, is initiated by the spirit of God through the word of God and, and our experiences with God are all aligned with that. Yeah, I think it's really important. Like when you ask me these outward experiences, I do obviously think they occur. It's not like they just sure. stopped at the mm -hmm. end of now. You know, it's just, 
But I think it's really important to test it by the word of God to make sure that would line up. Because I mean, I've had people, you have Tom, I'm sure Daniel, Joel, you have too, to go, hey, I was thinking about making this major life change. And I saw a green car go by the store, and that's exactly the sign I needed from God. Green means this, go. And there's a simplistic <laughs> nature of, that must be God speaking to me. Yeah. Rather than, hey, listen, we have a more sure word of prophecy. and. Yeah. That, that God reveals himself according to his word and through prayer and through confirmation of the spirit. Well, dig into that for a moment, Tommy, Mm -hmm. because that, that that probably helps, I think as much as anything in the, in the, in the new Testament to kind of blend together the, the word of God with our Mm -hmm. experiences. And, you know, you, you made reference to Moses and the transfiguration Mm -hmm. and, and then Peter's commentary on that. Just, just unpack that for a moment. So there's more sure word of prophecy, right? So he's saying though an angel of the Lord even come and say something, we have a more sure word of prophecy. And so the word of God becomes the foundational truth for all of the experiences. The experiences don't dictate the word of God. The word of God dictates the word of God and our experiences are filtered through that. And so I've had people come to me, young couples, hey, we're starting a new business. We're moving because when we were out and about, this thing that must be of God appeared to us. And instead of going, hey, have you dug into his word and got Mm -hmm. confirmation through prayer and the spirit, their experience dictated their next move, not the more sure word of prophecy. So, and, and Daniel, just, it'd be interesting kind of perspective. So if I said to you, there's objective and subjective, mm-hmm. the objective would be what God reveals to us from his word. Mm-hmm. How, how would you, what would the subjective look like? Well, I think the subjective would look like the things that, that even God's word says he uses in order to Mm -hmm. and so for example scripture talks in regular both in both in picture and principle but then in 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 direct command about the value of of counsel and Mm -hmm. so i mean all of us would attest to the fact that we've sat with people and somebody you know i've joked but only half joking and said you know hey my wife said something to me and it was the voice of the holy spirit in my life you know and it's like you know i'm 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 not trying to (laughs) theologically parse that but i am suggesting God's graced me with you know, a godly wife or wise counsel and people who mm-hmm. can reinforce the truth, speak truth into my life that God uses to serve. I wasn't reading the Bible when Tommy said something to me, yet what Tommy said mm-hmm. reinforced the, right. the powerful truth of, of, of God's life. I do think God can use circumstances, in fact, mm-hmm. does use circumstances to teach us. I mean, we have taught so much about the significance of of, of suffering and, and how God can use it um, to reveal himself in deeper ways to us. And so I think those become to paint the whole picture of both, yeah, the, the, the word of God, we can open it up and there it is in, in black and white. And yet, and God is also working in and around and through us. And it is not different than the Old or the New Testament and how he was moving in people, in places, and in, in, in circumstances in order ultimately to accomplish his will, but also to accomplish his will in and, and through us. In this whole conversation, I think it's interesting. You, you, we see, and we've kind of intentionally, and, and I think it makes sense, we focused on, in most cases, um, you know, these kind of what I would call pretty spectacular manifestations what we what we should not ignore is is that you know in in these individuals lives even take all these great you know kind of characters in scripture abraham moses isaiah elijah what we have written and oftentimes it's these high points or these uh, and i think a great way to view the narrative is these episodic moments there are in most cases years and years of time unrecorded where we have to assume and I think we can infer from scripture that in the majority of the time God was not speaking to them through the wind fire and earthquake but it was through the daily grind it was I'm going to get up and I'm going to do what God's called me to do I'm going to serve him I'm going to seek him I'm going to be with him and both of those are equally valuable I think we we are able to learn from these highlight moments what we would call kind of that big picture of how God routinely works. But the point of Moses at the burning bush is not that there was a bush on fire. It's what God said to him. And in and, and every one of these circumstances, the, 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 the key thing is the voice or the word of the Lord. And yeah, it happened in a wrestling match, and it, it, it you know it happens with a, a soldier, the arm, the commander of the army of the Lord, and it happens with the you know. But the the point isn't 
God's going to reveal it. Them, it's you know? the yeah. the the point is it's His Word, and it, He does reveal Himself. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I think we have to kind of hold all of that um, in intention. You mm-hmm. know, Joel. People, I, I let me do a little pastoral kind of you know counsel or whatever pastoral advice. I, I guess I would say, you know, people oftentimes wonder what's the will of God for me. How, how do how do I know that? And I think. I think what happens oftentimes is the way, reason people get confused or, or they, they get off track mm-hmm. is they tend to start at the most subjective point and, and they try mm-hmm. to work their way to the objective mm-hmm. when you're better to start at the objective point and work to the subjective. So, and, and I'm just going to do this really simple. Right? Can you do this before you do that? Just, yeah. just assuming who's listening to this, explain the difference between the subjective and the objective. Well, objective, I'm going to be real clear. Yeah. Objective is God, what God reveals in his word. Mm-hmm. That's the most objective. Mm-hmm. Subjective is going to be our experience. Like experience. The way we, yeah, the way right. So so starting at the objective, it's it's the word of God, mm-hmm. what God shows me from his word, right? The, a, a man's heart devises the way the Lord directs his step. God's going to reveal something to you. Spirit of God, how, how the spirit of God takes the objective truth and reality of God and, and, and brings it into my life, right? The third thing is God puts people in, in my mm-hmm. life, wise people counsel. Right. So... Mm-hmm. I don't want to be out there doing things on my own. I want some confirmation from that. Fourth thing is what I would call the open door. Daniel called it circumstances, mm-hmm. right? God opens and shuts doors, and and you can see the hand of God circumstantially working on. And then the final thing is peace, peace in your heart, right? The peace of God shall rule, shall arbitrate in in your heart, become the the, the umpire in your life. Now, if you start with peace. <laughs> you may have a hard time getting to. You'll tend to. Too. You'll land on what's easy or comfortable. Right. right. Yeah. And I'm not trying to oversimplify formulaic yeah, 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 it, yeah. but but to me it always works this way. What is God saying to me that's clear from His Word? Can I actually pinpoint this on a biblical truth or or, or principle or verse? How does the Spirit of God take that truth and apply it to my life? What are the wise counsel people that that walk the path that I know mm-hmm. are filled with the Spirit of God that have my best interest at heart, but also know, can speak directly into my life, right? Not, not people that are going to just tell me what I want to hear. Yeah. And then fourthly, how, how, how do I see God working this circumstantially? What are the open and shut doors? Am I pushing on a door that God's shut? Or am I trying to close a door that God is opening, right? And then finally, how's the peace of God ruling in my heart over this matter? And, and to me... The beauty of that is all of that's an encounter with God. Mm-hmm. The fact that God can give me peace right. over something that he's spoken in my heart about is really kind of a, it's, it's miraculous. And, and when people come into my life and say things, I'm like, how did you even know? Mm-hmm. I, you know, you mm-hmm. gave me a word mm-hmm. that I needed and I may not have even asked for it. They just, you know, they, they spoke it in my life or, you know, God opens a door and I'm thinking, man, I didn't even and an, an exa- mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you an example for me is the third campus we have at Mandarin, right? I mean, God convicted me one day. It was, just, it was on a piece of paper as a goal that we had set, but I wasn't really actively doing anything about it. And, and, and you know, God was dealing with my heart about, about praying, and he, he showed me some things in his word. And, and it, you know, it, it, was a, it was a faith initiative in my life that I was, I was not acting out on, on something that God had laid on my heart to do and you know man I feel bad I'm not supposed to be a pastor of the church and you know I'm just thinking I don't know what's going to fall out of the heaven I don't know you know so, I mean I started searching the word of God and praying the spirit of God did a work in my life and and you know God opened a door that was just unmistakable and in that case again to show you it's not formulaic then I sought advice from people and they, mm-hmm. they confirmed and then finally you know the the peace of God I'm sitting here I mean in in six, seven weeks, it'll have been one year, yeah. and there's confirmation that this was a, something that was of God. And people ask me, I mean, I preachers asked me last week, how did you know? Well, it's not one thing, but it's clearly, an, it's a God thing, and God manifested himself. And it, it got done not because of me or because of mm-hmm. our organization or the talent of our people. It got done because God was in it, and God... We had our burning bush. We had our, you know, wrestling at the brook. We had our, you know, the <laughs> lordship of Jesus at the battle of Jericho. We, the, we had those moments. Mm-hmm. And, and collectively, we've 
responded to what God has revealed in our lives. And, and I think, and again, I don't want to make that, oh, okay, so that's just what happens in corporate church. church, church. That's hap- that happens for me individually. Yeah. And that is, and I think that's what, I think sometimes, you know, Tommy, a little confession on me is that I don't know that I talk enough about that kind of experiential side of things, mm-hmm. but, but that's how God has always worked in my life. And, you know, I can look back and tell you the story of it didn't happen because I was smart. It didn't happen because I was, you know, I wasn't lucky. I wasn't in the right place. It, it happened because God was working. And the more you're open to and, and you're in tune to God work. I mean, that's, a, I mean, it's the thing. We actually looked at the piece of property that we ended up buying at Oak Leaf, And one of our conclusions was, we could never we afford, afford it. it. Yeah, we could right. never afford yeah. it. I mean, literally. I mean, yeah. I remember. And we kept coming back, and we'd have these kind of random one-off conversations. But that would be the ideal place if we could ever get it. I mean, literally. <laughs> yeah. that, that was the whole conversation. Mm-hmm. And we went from, that would be amazing if we could ever do it, but we could never afford it, mm-hmm. to we bought it at such a significant discount. The only way you can describe it, mm-hmm. it was a God thing. And God was working even when we didn't think he could work, right? And, I, I, and so I, my, I guess my point is, don't look at these things in the Old Testament and think, hey, that happened to them. It happens today, and it happens in our lives in a regular I, and, way. And I think on just to kind of le- lean into that for a moment, I think if we could kind of get that switch flipped in, in our mind's eye that, uh, that, boy, I wish God would do something, God is doing something. He is working. His presence is, is available, and I, I'm convinced uh, that the, the reality is it's not that we're, we, we're waiting on him. He's waiting on us. We're not seeking it. We're, we're, we're missing what he's doing. And I think if we really, and I think that's been kind of one of the hopes of this whole series is that, hey, God desire, and I think we, we said this already, God desires this relationship with us, this, this experience with us. And if you seek him, you'll find him. And I'm, I'm convinced more often than not, it's not that God's not there. It's just that we've, we've missed it. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, and and that's why this this whole conversation for us, I'm hope I'm hopeful, and in, in our lives, you know, has been has been both an encouragement, a reminder. It's been convicting, a challenge uh, about what God is doing. I think in 2022, I love the illustration, Tom, and I think in 2022, here's what many people that walk through the door of the church is walk into the doors of our office. Here's their experience with God. It was the fourth finger you lifted up. It's the circumstance. And if this circumstance is right, if this lines up, yeah. then this must be a God encounter and this is where I should go. And I think the word of God, you use the thumb for your illustration. To me, it's not linear. It's actually the doorway to interpret all of this. Mm-hmm. The word of God is how you interpret what peace really is. That's how you know if you've got a good friend in your life. That's how you know if there's circumstances of God. And if people walk in and say, hey, I had this, cir- I had this circumstance show up and they've not been in the word of God, and they've not fulfilled it, then they are so monolithic in the way they're making a God experience, God encounter, that it's a recipe for instability and disappointment with God. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Joel, I, I don't want to hide you. I, mean, I know you prepare for these podcasts. No, and, this is and, great. <laughs> and you have, but Daniel just said something I think is really critical um, to understanding how, how God works in, in present day. And you remember the, the little passage, ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. It's one of the first kind of passages that, that I locked into um, when I became a Christian. And um, sometimes I forget how, how incredibly powerful and practical that is. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> ask, it, it, asking usually, you know, you're... you're looking for something, right? Um, seek, you usually are seeking a person, right? Knock, you're, you're looking to get through a door. So he says, see, uh, ask it, be given to you, seek, and you find, knock, and it shall be open unto you. Um, for everyone that asks, receive it. He that seeks, finds, and him that knocks, it shall be open. Then Jesus uses this really interesting analogy. Says, if, if a son shall ask bread of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks... For a fish, will you give him a serpent? You know, will you give him a snake, right? And in the implication, then he answers that: if you are evil and know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father? Now, listen to how he answers that: 
not give you things, not open the doors, not, right? How much more should the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit himself to them that ask him? And when Daniel says, we should be seeking after God, we, when you move from, I'm seeking after God so I can get things, or I'm seeking after God so I can find solutions, or I'm seeking after God so I can get some kind of relief in my life, right? If you seek after God for God, how much more mm -hmm. is he going to give you of himself? How much more is he going to give the Holy Spirit? And that is the encounter with God is when you know experientially the fullness of the Spirit in your life and the reality of his presence, which, which trumps everything, which actually, you know, and, and, and maybe, maybe in a, in a way we, we, we've not gotten that direct and practical in this mm -hmm. series. I, I mean, I, I suppose that could be, you know, that could be true, but that is the underlying thing. God wants to come into your life in, 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 in measure and fullness beyond what you can even imagine. Well, I've, in my mind, I've been thinking of a series for teenagers. If you guys have been talking about this, <laughs> the, the five fingers of knowing God's will. You know? <laughs> there it is right there. <laughs> but that's, it's, it's so true and it's so helpful as you see these circumstances and these experiences. And in this picture of Isaiah, as we've talked about, uh, there's really a big picture of surrender as he's facing a very difficult circumstance. The king has died and he steps into this area of surrender. But, you know, when we surrender, it's not always as easy as it sounds to whatever God's calling us to do. In Isaiah's, the story, he says, I'll, I'll go and speak for you. But God's like, okay, well, it's going to be a very unpopular message. It's going to be difficult. So if we continue down that path of God's will, what does surrender look like when it is difficult? Even though you may have peace of the situation, how can you, maybe someone that's listening or watching, they feel God calling them something, but they're like, how in the world is this going to happen? How can they have the faith to trust God in such a difficult situation? You know, I think it is, if you, if you think about, for, for most of us, and I would assume for the majority of the people listening, um, surrender is difficult because it's, it is to our nature or flesh. It's, it's a little counter, as it's pictured in the Bible, it's a little counterintuitive to pretty much how we formulate most of our decisions and commitments. And so um, the majority of us, we make commitments. We surrender ourselves after we have fully examined a, a circumstance or a situation front and back and we've understood the pros and the cons and we understand how we'll benefit from mm -hmm. you know the situation and what we're willing to do and in in a lot of contexts even all, us at the table we'd say that's how you make good decisions yeah you know you you've you've kind of factored in in, in all sides i think biblical surrender is where we actually have to come to the place where we're going to set ourselves aside and we're, we're literally we're, we're not we're, we're we're going to lay down our life before we've fully understood and I, I do think it's a powerful example you know God says he'll go and then Isaiah before he knows where he's going and mm -hmm. what he's about to say which you're exactly right mm -hmm. is going to be a message incredibly unpopular and of judgment he says I'll go and and there is a there is a point of what I would call biblical surrender that actually kind of has to pull against what I would call the 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 natural inclinations of our of our flesh, which tend towards self preservation, um, and 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 what benefits us and what's going to move us forward. Because what we're ultimately coming to the conclusion of we we've used this word both in the series we and we've used it today already is the idea of lordship and 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 lordship you know two words priority and authority and what is it that's gonna that's gonna have the priority and the authority in in our life when you get to isaiah um and in in this chapter in this call he he, he makes a definitive decision that's that, that someone else is going to have the authority and the priority in his life, and he gives himself to it, regardless of what come of what comes next. Hey, that's really good. I'm I was trying to 
smooth out some wording in a sermon we're going to use an upcoming series and he just that authority and priority I, that was what i'm looking for so that was a that was a god thing really good daniel i'll give you all the credit for that one That's, i'd love that the the um so let me let me just let me unpack this one thing and joel when when you think about leading teenagers um here here's a good way to look at this so in Surrender again. Think that's that is the experiential side of we're responding to and and you know when you and I love studying the Old Testament. You you, you have the the, the Pentateuch, you have the historical mm-hmm. books, you have the the poetic books, and you have the prophets. And you know you get this disruption in the in the poetic books where it's a lot of it is is how we look up at God and, and that's a little bit simplistic but it's it's mm-hmm. it's written into it when you get into the you know the, the prophetic books it's god looking down at us right and and so how do we respond to what god's doing and and really how, how do we respond to what god is so here here's what happens in isaiah's life one he sees right so seeing is believing in 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 this case and then he hears there's the objective revelation of what's being said right holy 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 and then he experiences or feels right the place is shaken and and then off the altar his lips are touched and it's clear that when that happens his sin is forgiven his iniquity is cleansed and in response to that he says god here am i So surrender is always a response to God's graciousness and how he reveals himself, Mm -hmm. how he speaks to us, and how he cleanses us. So if God speaks, God reveals himself, God speaks to us, God cleanses us, then we surrender. Mm -hmm. And that is an important, again, sequential, but it's an important aspect when you talk to young people. Moralism says, give your life to God. Right, the gospel says Jesus gave His life for you. How can you do anything but surrender your life to Him? And that I think is the beauty of this story. I think that is what what gets us to surrender in our lives. So you said the word I was thinking when it comes to this passage of scripture. It talks a lot about holiness and you know the call for you know personal holiness in our life. Tommy, how do we differentiate? personal holiness from moralism, the word that pastor used, you know, what's the danger of getting those lines blurred and how do we differentiate those two in just our spiritual lives? Yeah. I mentioned when we were in sermon prep talking about this, it's like one of my favorite quotes of all times, R.C. Sproul, when he just says the problem in the world is God is holy and you're not. And God provides a remedy for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that's, and he preached it his whole life. His, right. his last sermon was oxygen in his nose. And he goes, the problem in the world is God's holy and you're not. Mm-hmm. And so in this passage, it's not just that the king had died. That, that was an, a, a major event. Mm-hmm. But you're coming out of chapter five when the country's in ruins. And God starts chapter five by saying, I've done everything. What more could I have done for you? Here's this vineyard. Here's these lands. And the first thing you did with it, the land I gave you, you try to start accumulating and lay land by land by land and build monopolies. He goes, and you've got corrupt rulers and you've got drunken parties. And I've been so good to you. When Tom was talking, I thought about the idea of, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice. That's the idea of surrender, holy and acceptable. So Isaiah sees all of this country and these woes being pronounced and woe upon the country. And you're about to go into the Babylonian captivity. And when he gets a picture of it, here's where personal holiness, he sees all that and he says, woe is my country. No, he doesn't. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, woe are our leaders. Mm -hmm. He says, woe is me. And so he personalizes this idea of personal holiness. So um, moralism is if I behave this way, then here's where I get standing. Mm -hmm. Here's what it is. I only find my standing in Jesus Christ. And that's where I'm declared to be righteous, declared to be holy. And Tom's right. We have this awareness then in response to his holiness and his spirit. I have no other option than to surrender my life to him. So that's how I would personalize holiness for me. So then does materialism play a role in that? I know you mentioned that. Does, does that get into the mix of what happened in, those, in that passage? It happens <laughs> within three verses in chapter <laughs> number five of Isaiah, where it's like, you know, here's these guys that are, it actually says they're laying their land upon land, that there's no more room. 
It's like the more I accumulate into my life and here's God going, I gave you all this. And now you're finding your value and your worth in accumulating what I gave you. Mm -hmm. And one of the intricacies of the passage is you laid it side by side so that there was no more room. I know it's talking about land and properties, but God's saying there's no room for me inside of your materialism. So uh, it's a fascinating play on what what, what Tommy just said. I, I do think, and and then Isaiah chapter six just kind of lays this bare for us. Mm-hmm. But you know, one of the key differences between holiness and what it looks like to be holy or what it looks like to be moral is is our view of self, mm-hmm. and and fundamentally, moral people see themselves as good. And, you know, I joke and I know I've done this and I'll probably do it, you know, or have done it on, on Sunday as we record this. But, you know, it's like everybody, you know, if they say, hey, are you a good person? You know, every, generally everybody's like, yeah, I'm, I'm a good person. So moralism, so we, we fundamentally see ourselves as good. And then we're, we're trying to work in our own strength and power to make ourselves more good. And and then what Tommy just said, and, and in order to... Uh, maintain standing and favor, whether, whether, whether it's with God or, or others. Holiness uh, stands in such contrast in the way that we view ourselves fundamentally. If moralism, we see ourselves as good. Um, holiness allows us to see ourselves as, 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 as broken and, and sinful. And, and, and Isaiah famously you know, makes that declaration, woe, woe is me, I am undone. And, 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 and I think it, be, it begins to create a distinction, not only in our behavior, but in our heart motivations about how we a- approach the Lord when, when we see ourselves for who we are, and then we see ourselves for who God is, it becomes clear and sometimes painfully clear mm-hmm. that the answer is not in us. The favor, the standing, the future, the success, it's, it's not in us. We, we don't have it. It is in the one who is holy. And then, and I'm not trying to get on a, I mean, but, and then that is the message of the gospel, is that the righteousness of God has been impu- imputed onto us through Jesus Christ. And, and it's so, so then we can live in holy ways and live in holiness, not because we're good people, but because God's good. And, uh, yeah, so and, moralism yeah. is so comparative yeah. <laughs> by nature. You're right. It almost right. wants you to, you want to preach this out. Right. So I know. I know. This moralism is so comparative. So I'm going to compare me to you. I'm going to compare me to an objective standard of, okay, if I do this, then I'm moral. So in moralism, I'm comparing myself to you guys. This is this comparative. Mm-hmm. In holiness, I'm comparing myself to one person. Right. And that becomes a different perspective. Yeah. Let, and let's go back to this. I think, I think we don't get an opportunity to reinforce this so much, but you, you always start the podcast is with our mission statement, helping everyday people ex- experience extraordinary life with God. Mm-hmm. So when God created us, he created us to live in his presence. And, you know, that's, that's the idea of face to face with God, mm-hmm. right? And Adam and Eve sinned and they hid from the presence of the Lord. And the problem was they lacked holiness, right? Mm-hmm. So the Bible story is not how do what do we do to recover that holiness so that we can get back into the presence of God? It's actually the opposite. It's what does God do mm-hmm. to come and provide holiness for us so He makes it possible for us to come back, and and that's that is the fundamental difference in moralism. It depends on me and how I perform, and the gospel. It depends on what. Jesus has done for me. And now I can recover the life, the presence of God, the face of God that I lost in the Garden of Eden. And, and that's, what we're, that's what we're after. And, and I get, take the whole series. God keeps coming to us because he wants to bring us back into a relationship with him. And all of these stories have gospel elements to them, right? They're, they're, all, they're all embedded gospel truths that show our relationship with God is not dependent upon what we do it's dependent upon what he does for us and how how we recover that and that again that that there's a mystery in that and there's a there's a graciousness about that that when I got out of bed this morning whether I was going to meet God or not really didn't depend on me Mm -hmm. it it all depends on him and and that's what makes the pursuit of 
him and the pursuit of holiness, all these great concepts, um, you know, realities that we can experience and um, should be very encouraging to people. I mean, you said, if I was, it makes me want to just find God and meet him, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, have an experience with him. So how then do I fight against this idea of saying, I believe in the holiness of God, but then I find myself daily living an unholy life. And how do I keep from falling into that trap? And maybe something I'm like, yes, I'm about the holiness of God, but I find myself regularly practicing an unholy life. You well, just thank God that Romans 7 still in the Bible. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, okay, so, I mean, there's so many places to do it. But if, yeah. you, if you kind of take the theme of all that we've talked about today is mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the presence of the Spirit of God inside of you is, mm -hmm. is what makes it possible for mm -hmm. you to have victory over sin. It's what conforms you into the image of Jesus. It's, it's what, if you will, you know, it gives you the spirit fullness of life. It allows you to, to kind of ditch the works of the flesh, to, to kill off, mortify the deeds of the flesh so that you can be full and fully controlled by um, the Holy Spirit. And so I think it's, it is the, the great disciplines of the Christian life or the great practice of the Christian life is, is saturating yourself with the Word of God. It's yielding yourself completely to the Spirit of God, and it's living out of that which God has done for you through the gospel. So it's mind, I know, right? Mm -hmm. It's heart, I let the truth of God, what he's done for me, inform my heart. And then that, I act on that through my will. And I, I live out of the new creation that I am in Jesus, not out of my old sinful flesh mm -hmm. and, and flesh patterns and the old man that I was before I met Jesus. So this may be a little bit of a backtrack, but I'm interested in this, and I'll kind of go around the table. Uh, you know, we talked about surrender and knowing God's will, and it is obviously something that people are, you know, listening and watching are like, mm -hmm. they're maybe in a situation of making a small decision or a big decision. I don't know if I've heard these stories from you all yet, so I'm interested. When we talk about the idea of surrendering to, to God's call, we see Isaiah surrender here. For your life personally, with what you're currently doing, let's, for example, let's say you are in vocational ministry, the call of being a pastor. Was it one God encounter that you say it was that night mm -hmm. at that place that I remember? Because I think that's important because a lot of times we think, or is it multiple God encounters that brought you to where you are, are on God's call. We'll, we'll go around the table, but I'm interested in hearing what it was like for you <clears throat> for God's call on your life now and how'd you experience it? Yeah, I, well, I think it's what we've articulated already. And in my life, it, 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 it played out very similarly. And I think what we've said today is simply that at times God does unmistakable, you know, really kind of big things, you know, in, in the lives of people at, in a moment or in a place in a mm -hmm. time. And so I would say in my own personal life, if you'd say, hey, are there some times in your life where kind of God unmistakably worked or moved as it relates to, you know, the call right. vocationally mm -hmm. or toward, in minute or, you know, whatever it is. And yeah. I would say, oh, absolutely. I, I remember when I was 13 years old. In fact, I loved it. I, I share this almost every time uh, that I uh, get a chance to speak to to to, to students, which mm -hmm. I feel like as I get older is less and less. No, but, um, come on, I got you. But uh, anyway, so <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, hey, uh, which is that that hey, two of the most significant things that God did in my life uh, were in junior high and high school, 13 and 17 years old. I, I I can look back on those and go, those were those were big moments, unmistakable moves of God in my life. I would say, although I might talk about those, the more significant work of surrender and presence of God in my life has, has not been those times. Okay. It's been in the day to day. That's good. And at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I'm sure maybe even on this podcast have, have uh, quoted the Eugene Peterson wrote one of uh, my favorite books about what it looks like to experience, experience God. And he talks about discipleship as a long obedience in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And so while I'm, I'm thankful for those kind of mountaintop moments or, or, 
you know, inc- you know, memorable moments. I think the real significant work uh, that God's done in my life has has been way less spectacular, way more under the radar, way more private and and personal, or or actually in, in corporate and communal within the body of Christ in my life. Um, and it's been it's been more daily than it has been in in these mountaintop moments. Pastor, you've been at the same thing for 40 years. What was it that brought you yeah, to that so and keeps I, you going? Very similar. That? I would say there's a couple of things there, you know, and, and I, I preached this and talked about it. You, you'll have spiritual breakthroughs in your life and you ought to be able to look back and see these, these moments and times where, you know, it's kind of like, you know, most of your life is inch by inch, step right. by step, yard by yard. Right. But every once in a while, you you you, you hit a hail mary. You know, you, you <laughs> get a long touchdown pass. Yeah, and, That's a good way to put and it. you have fewer of those, <laughs> but they they move you. And so I have had a series of breakthroughs in my life, and they all were particular surrender issues, mostly about my willingness to do what God wanted me to do, or rearranging the priorities of my life, where where things were more aligned with what I wanted to do, not not what God wanted me to do. And, you know, kind of the, the hinge point for me was, um, it, again, if you talk about the objective and subjective, I really began to wrestle with, for the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge it, that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and they which live should not live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And, and you know, in, in summary, it just became this issue that, Jesus loves me more than anything else or anybody else. And he demonstrated that love by what he did on the cross. And the only reason that I have life is because Jesus gave up his life for me. So the only logical response for me is to surrender my life to him. And and that was my breakthrough moment. And whatever God wants to do in my life, it positionally, vocationally. See, I don't think somebody, I don't think I'm more called than somebody else because I, I vocationally am in ministry. Right. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the surrender on my part to get there is no different than the surrender in anybody else's life to be where they are and doing what they're doing. It's, and it's all rooted in the fact that Jesus loved me enough to give up his life for me and give me life. And in him giving me life, the least I can do, the, the very base of and beginning point of what I can do for him is, is live for him. And whatever that looks like, I made that decision, you know, 40 something years ago that, that I was going to surrender to him. And I've had, I had to have multiple breakthrough Mm -hmm. moments Mm -hmm. in my life to get there, but it's been fleshed out over the, what I call the inch by inch, Mm -hmm. you know? So Tommy, you're probably the most recent in a life change direction. So it's probably most fresh with you, I would think. It is, but for me, I know you said it's like breakthrough. For me, it's almost like an EKG. It's like five years old, I gave my life to Christ, right? And so then this journey continues. I'm 18, I'm out of town, unmistakably, it's like the Lord moves upon my heart that that's the time for me to be baptized. And so I called my wife back, my wife, my girlfriend at the time, and said, hey, the Lord's just moving on my heart to be baptized. Well, she drops the phone and runs around the neighborhood screaming like a charismatic, and she's like, this is the greatest thing ever. I've been praying for you to take a spiritual step in your life. So here's a massive breakthrough. Now this is funny, it seems like we think these are really massive moments. Um, I was cleaning out, we're doing some construction in our house. So I was cleaning out of our stuff and I ran across my Berkman. So this is the first time you and, ever, you and I ever talked about, hey Tommy, vocational ministry. Right, vocational ministry. Mm-hmm. That was nine years ago, it was in nine years. Huh. And so sometimes the Lord presents the pathway forward, Mm -hmm. but there are a lot of steps to get there. And I'm thinking about Elijah. It would have been really great if God would have told him right off the bat when he said, Hey, I am, I only am left. He could have went, no, 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 no. There's 7,000 people. He didn't. Yeah. He allowed it to be unfolded later in life. And so I think I, I resonate with David whenever I'm in down emotional moments, I'm going to read the words of David. And I think hidden valleys turn shepherds into Kings. And I think sometimes those hidden valleys when nobody sees your spiritual life, when you're in the daily grind, as Daniel puts it. And I love the word that Tom used. It's one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. The love of Christ constrains us. It's this irresistible urging forward, but it's not all mountaintops. It's just daily grind. So I would say, yeah, I'm the newest. I've been here two years, but it's a journey that started Started. when I was five. 
so I wouldn't look for the massive exaltation and God's going to put you in a place of it started when I was five years old. Yeah. So the holiness in, uh, of God, living a holy life, pursuing him in surrender. Sometimes it could be the Hail Mary pass. Other times it's little by little, inch by inch, yeah. long obedience uh, in the same direction. Uh, such a great conversation uh, today. Thank you so much for listening. And I encourage you to uh, like, subscribe, follow. I think they've changed it to now on the Apple podcast, however you'd like to do it. Apple, Spotify, you can download the Trinity app. And if you're part of our ministry, I do want to remind you coming up one of our biggest outreaches of the year, Trunk or Treat, happening on October 30th from 5 to 7 at all three locations. We'd love for you to volunteer to be a part of that huge outreach event so we can go together on mission. Hey, thank you so much for watching or listening today. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.